Hello, everyone. My name is Tian Henling. I'm a PhD student at the University of Duisburg Essen from last November. Uh, my research centers around the on-device AI, and the topic of my presentation today is quantized transformer model for time series analysis. So to share some initial findings uh, on the first step to achieve on-device AI, and I would like to start by introducing my motivation for researching this topic, which is closely to my ongoing research project. I'm currently involved in the Haver project. So in this project, our goal is to develop an AI-assisted system to tackle the issue of untreated wastewater overflow during heavy rainfall. So based on data collected in uh, waste, uh, uh, collected by sensors at uh, wastewater treatment plants, sewers, and overflow ponds. So to put it simply, it is. Uh, this project involves a time series analysis application. So as you may know that in a purely cloud-based AI system, a significant drawback is their heavy reliance on stable internet connection. So this system, uh, so as these systems perform all tasks in the cloud, so any disruptions in the internet connection, especially during extreme weather conditions, can lead to potential issues and hinder the functionalities. So my work involves adding on-device AI as a backup. So this allows resource-limited IoT devices to make local decisions independently without relying only on the cloud. So during the normal operation, the added AI hardware acts as a general processor. So handling data rate and uh, transmission from the sensors. Additionally, it is equipped with deep learning hardware accelerators translated from the cloud-based uh, model. So when the cloud is down or disconnected, the AI hardware can utilize the stored accelerators to make local decisions based on newly collected data. So this approach can also offer additional advantages such as reduced uh, latency. And uh, as Professor Schiller mentioned yesterday, our AI hardware named as Elastic Node has now reached its fifth generation with significant updates. So thanks to its compact size, the Elastic Node can simply integrate into IoT devices, providing a powerful on-device AI solutions. And the main calculation units of Elastic Node include a low-power microcontroller and an embedded field programmable gate arrays to achieve, so to achieve high energy efficiency. So the MCU handles coordinating and networking tasks. And uh, uh, the FPGA is activated to execute deep learning um, hardware accelerators when needed, when required. So the task can be defined as to transform models to accelerators, which is deployable on resource-limited IoT devices, uh, especially on the FPGAs, without sacrificing model performance. And our lab already has experience in um, deploying deep learning models to IoT devices. We have successfully deployed a fixed point MLP, CNN, and LSTM models on various generations of our AI hardware for time series analysis tasks. And uh, me, so as a new generation PhD student, building on this experience, I plan to explore the implementation of novel and irregular architectures. So my focus is on the transformer network, aiming to uncover its potential for on-device AI solutions. So next, I would like to introduce you to the transformer network. So I think you might be familiar with the recently popular ChatGPT and actually it is originated from the transformer network. And the vanilla transformer network is introduced by, uh, was introduced by Google in 2017 for machine translation tasks. And if we view the transformer model as a single entity, 
So especially in the English Armenian translation tasks, so it takes an English trans uh, an English sentence as input, and generates the corresponding Armenian translation as output. And during the training, the model will be given the target sentence as input as well. So it is called as teacher forcing method, which helps speed up learning and improve the quality of the translation. And when we look into the transformer network, it mainly consists of an encoder and a decoder, and both encoder and decoder consist of the same number of stacked encoder layers and decoder layers respectively. And the source sentence goes into the encoder, so through an, here through, oh, where is the, Okay, so the embedding layer and the positional encoding operation, and similarly, the target sentence undergoes the same process and is fit into the decoder. And after the decoding processor, the decoder output will be fit into the output layer, which consists of a linear layer and a softmax function. So this enables us to obtain the probability of each word, and according to corresponding dictionary then we can obtain the predicted sentence. And in each encoder layer, there is a multi-head self-attention module followed by a feed-forward narrow network module. And the decoder layers follow a similar structure, but with an additional module called the multi-head context attention module. And it's self uh, and it's Multi-head self-attention module has an additional sequence masking approach uh, to prevent the decoder from accessing future information. In addition, each module is followed by a skip connection and a layer normalization operation. And then let's talk about, let's talk about the basic modulus. So the structure of the FFN module remains the same in each encoder and a decoder. So it consists of two linear layers with a ReLU function in between. And this module enhances model's ability to capture intricate patterns in the data. And there are three types of attention modular in the transformer model. One type in the encoder and two types in the decoders, and the figure on the left so it shows a detailed view of the attention modulus, which maintain uh, the same structure for all types of attention modulus. So each module receives three input metrics. So Q for query, and a K for keys, and a V for uh, values, so generated by the corresponding linear layers. So if the inputs that generates Q, K, V are the same, so the model will be called as self-attention module. And if the inputs that generate Q are derived from the last module, and uh, the inputs that generate uh, K and V are obtained from the encoder output, output, the module is called as context attention module. So this mechanism allows to produce contextually informed translation. And then the input metrics are divided into several sub-space of information. This allows the attention module uh, to focus on different aspects of the features. This is the reason it's named as multi-head. And in each head, a scaled dot product operation is parallelly performed to obtain the weighted compatibilities between words in the same sentence or between the input sentence, uh, the source sentence, and the target sentence. So the outputs from each head are then concatenated and passed through an output linear layer to precede the next uh, step. So. Um, considering the similarities between test-based and uh, time-based uh, theories, so since 2019, uh, quite a few researchers have applied the transformer architecture in the time series field. So, however, there are still difference between these two types of theories. Uh, so researchers have made modifications to the vanilla transformer network in main five parts. So the first modification is input transformation. So as the input is 
time series now. So the world embedding layer is discarded. Directly, a fully connected layer can be used. And some hybrid transformer network will also adopt uh, like uh, autoregressive uh, methods, for example. And the second change involves the positional encoding. So to enhance the capture of temporal information and sequence in the time series. So various technologies have been proposed, such as uh, the second one is the learnable positional encoding. And the next change is the decoder input. So in time series analysis tasks, so the, encode, uh, the decoder, sorry, decoder input is historical data. Um, a commonly used method is the left shifted historical time series. But uh, how many steps to left depends on the nature of the data itself. And in some tasks, the decoder is directly replaced by a global energy polling layer, so the decoder input is not required anymore. And compared to the other deep learning network for time series, like uh, LSTM and maybe something else, and uh, the transformer network is better suited to parallel computing and it can further mitigate the problems of gradients vanishing and exploding, but the high computational complexity and the huge model size of this, model, uh, of this network has been its drawback. So aimed at reducing the computational effort of the transformer uh, network, the remaining modification are the optimization of the attention module and uh, the improvements in the architecture level innovation. For example, you can replace the attention model with a sparse attention, or you can also add in a polling layer. And uh, then, in addition to these modifications, model compression technologies are also effective ways to help transformer to be deployed on resource-limited devices. Uh, for instance, my colleague uh, Christopher introduced a narrow architecture search yesterday. And uh, the next speaker, uh, Alan, will discuss knowledge distillation. But uh, as for my research, I'm focusing on model quantization. And actually, there are also kinds of uh, quantization methods. And my study especially focused on affine quantization. And uh, this quantization involves mapping continuous floating point R, uh, floating point values R, so in the range with lower bound alpha and uh, upper bound beta to signed integers Q using bits. So for instance, by representing uh, floating point weights in 32 bits uh, as integers in only eight bits, we can save up to four times the memory space. And this mapping process can be implemented in two schemes. So a symmetric quantization scheme and a symmetric quantization scheme, depending on whether the alpha and beta are symmetric around the zero. And uh, let's look at the, um, I just call it AQ scheme. So the a symmetric quantization scheme can be uh, mathematically described by the equation one. So where here the S uh, represents the, the scale factor between the floating point value and the quantized uh, numbers. And while Z denotes the zero point, uh, which is an integer representation of the floating point uh, zero. And the dequantization process of the AQ scheme uh, is denoted by the last equation. And then is the SQ scheme. It is a specific type of AQ scheme as zero point is omitted. And to ensure absolute zero symmetry, the smallest integer is removed. So the number of representable integers is one less than that in the AQ scheme. Okay, so then let's go back to the transformer. So uh, the quantization on transformer is not a new topic and particularly in natural language processing and uh, computer vision. However, there are a lake of experimental 
experience focusing on quantization for time series analysis. And considering the modification I mentioned before uh, for the time series transformer model, I think there is a, there are differences in quantizing them as well. So I focusing on quantizing time series transformer network. And uh, in a recent study, researchers applied 8-bit uh, post-training quantization strategy to a transformer model. And this model is relatively uh, small. It only has around uh, 50,000 parameters. And uh, the structure is also simple. Um, it has an input layer and encoder layer and an output layer. So there's no decoder. And the task is based on 24 historical data points with virus futures to, uh, to predict the next uh, target variable. So the quantized model is deployed on a resource-limited MCU. Um, since there's no variable data for my research project yet, so I'm currently conducting my research on this related work. So firstly, I plan to obtain smaller model size. So 8-bit quantization is not enough. So lower bit quantization is preferred. And in addition, 176 milliseconds is also long for real-time tasks. So my goal is to achieve 10 times faster inference. And to achieve my goal of uh, lower bit quantization while maintaining model performance. I adopt a quantization aware training. So this quantization strategy trains uh, or fine tunes the model, uh, can ensure model precision even with lower bit quantization. In addition, uh, to pursue energy efficient and low power computing, our target uh, hardware platform is an FPGA and uh, about the frameworks. So although TensorFlow is currently relatively simple to use and uh, more mature in terms of model quantization and deployment, it is not flexible enough for some customized quantization methods and deployment uh, requirements. So my research is conducted on the PyTorch framework. And before exploring the quantization, I replicated this model on the same data set. So this task is an, is an air pollution uh, prediction task. Yeah. And the trained for precision transformer model achieved an impressive, so a not bad IMSE of around 3.9 and showing comparable performance to the reported IMSE in the related work. And according to my analysis, so in these models, there are around only eight linear layers, and the parameters of all linear layers constitute around 90% of the total. And by quantizing this linear layer from 32 bits to 8 bits, we can compress the model size by around three times. And therefore, I decided to quantize the linear layers first while remaining uh, the other uh, operation still in floating points. And the calculations in a uh, floating point linear layer in the training and uh, inference phase is like that. I think all of you is familiar with this formula and I will not introduce it anymore. And uh, if you use uh, and with uh, a fine quantization and if we choose weights, bias, inputs, outputs of the linear layer as quantization objects, so the computation during the inference can be expressed by this equation, so in the red color, and where uh, the AQ scheme is chosen for all quantization objects. So you can see that the uh, uh, weights, bias, inputs, outputs have the, 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 the zero points, yeah. But is AQ scheme uh, the best choice? Uh, so we can review the AQ and the SQ schema, so we can see that the SQ scheme has advantage of removing the computational overhead caused by the zero point. However, in the SQ scheme, the smallest integer is omitted, resulting in a loss of precision. And this loss is particularly obvious in low-bit quantization. Therefore, the trade-off 
between the precision and the computational overhead must be considered when choosing a quantization scheme. And typically, weights and bias in the linear layer exhibit a zero symmetric pattern, while your inputs and outputs follows a zero asymmetric pattern. So many relevant uh, studies utilize, just directly utilize the SQ scheme for weights and bias and the AQ scheme for inputs and uh, outputs. However, this assumption may only hold for some model architectures and uh, application be because it's also depending on the position of the linear layers in the model architecture. Um, and as the data distribution of the quantization objects can also vary. And so in my research topic, in my recent research, uh, in my recent paper, I proposed a research question. So can the model dynamically select the optimal quantization scheme for each quantization object in the linear layer during training? And well, since the quantization of the model parameters, so uh, for the weight and the bias, can be done before inference, my exploration of quantization scheme is limited to the inputs and outputs of the linear layers. And to do this, I have the model incorporate quantization scheme awareness during the training. So this approach allows us to update the quantization scheme. I call this approach the adaptive quantization scheme. And after each mini batch, uh, the quantization scheme selection is dynamically updated for individual quantization objects according to this equation. And this threshold can be adjusted according to the uh, data distribution. And well, due to the time limit, I will only explain the most important parts of my results. So uh, the SQ plus APQ configuration donates that the inputs and the outputs are quantized by the APQ scheme. We can see that the SQ plus APQ1 shows the configuration even obtains results closer to the four precision model IMSE than all AQ configuration with a 31% reduction in computational overhead. And then moreover, for some scenarios uh, where um, computational overhead is the most important, so we can see the two, so the SQ plus APQ2 showcased its effectiveness by offering an obvious reduction of 47% in computational overhead compared to the all AQ configuration, albeit with a slightly inferior IMSE. Um, this slight decline uh, could be attributed to the increased complexity introduced by the adaptive approach during the training. And then we uh, extended our experience to lower bit quantization. But uh, in this model architecture, the model output layer is sensitive uh, to four bit quantization. So we have to switch to mixed precision quantization. So all linear layers are quantized to four bits except the model output layer, which is quantized to eight bits. And we can see that unlike the four or uh, four eight bit quantization, applying the SQ scheme has a significant impact on the IMSE and it is much worse. And uh, affected by the SQ scheme, our SQ plus APQ configuration didn't brought a better IMSE than of the or AQ configuration, but still brought around 10% decrease in the computational overhead. And similarly, when computational overhead is considered important, so this configuration achieves an obvious reduction in overhead by around 62%, while its IMSE is 1.7% lower compared to the all SQ configuration. So in a short summary, the above experience so demonstrates the effectiveness of our proposed adaptive quantization scheme. 
And this is a rough introduction to my current research. I hope I can give you a general idea about work, what I'm working on and uh, about my future work. I intend to dive deeper into the adaptive quantization schemes to exploring more complex methods that use more explainable parameters rather than a simple threshold. And I would also like to explore more combinations of mixed precision quantization to obtain better model compression ratios. And additionally, I plan to quantize the remaining uh, calculations to achieve full quantization of the transformer model. And then we can put it uh, in our FPGA. Okay, thank you for your attention. I'm open for questions. Uh, in the last part I missed, what was the difference between the SQ with a P, I don't know the name, but then one and two variants? So you mean that uh, the difference between these two quantization yeah. schemes, right? Yep. The difference is that uh, one has the zero point, so you have to do the addition operation. Mm. Yeah. That, that, that was the, the one or the two? The one, the one. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean the difference between the numbers two. Yeah. Yeah. This one? No, the next. <laughs> this. Yeah. Uh, the difference between SQ, APQ, one, and two. Oh, the difference between APQ, oh, okay. So uh, I would say that uh, the first one uh, generates the best IMSE, so the smallest IMSE, and the second one generates the best reduction in operation, over, uh, operation overhead. So this is the difference between them. I use the same um, quantization schema, but I just want to show that uh, for different uh, scenarios, maybe you pursue different goals, like uh, sometimes the precision is the most important, then you just uh, accept that uh, your reduction in the operation overhead is just around uh, 30 percent. But if the operation overhead, the reduction in the operation overhead is the most important one, then you have to accept that there will be a little bit uh, uh, increase in the IMSE. Um, so what did you need to change for this? So, um, of course, yeah, the results are different, but um, is it the threshold that you changed? Is it the only thing that's different between scheme one and two? Uh, no, no, I didn't okay. change the threshold. Uh, for this set of experiments, uh, the threshold is fixed. I just uh, set the threshold as 0 0.1, yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. what did you change? to get these different results? Oh, I changed that, uh, I changed the applied quantization scheme to the inputs and outputs of the linear layers. This is the difference. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um. So maybe I should introduce what does all AQ mean. So all AQ and all SQ indicate that the AQ scheme and the SQ scheme were applied to mm -hmm. all quantization objects, respectively. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just because the, the bottom two, both are SQ scheme for parameters and APQ scheme for feature vectors. Yes. Um, yeah. And I'm just wondering how, how, do, how does the same scheme produce so different results? So what did you need to change? Oh, it, I didn't uh, uh, generate a different results. I just show that uh, um, be, because I let the model run maybe run 100 times and you can get the best uh, result and you can also get uh, the best result uh, for the operation, uh, operation overhead. Because it's uh. dynamically, you cannot, uh, you, 
every time the quantization scheme will be dynamically selected. So every time it will be different because it is a gradient ah, descent, okay. so it's different. Yeah. So that means those are two um, outcomes of this experiment. Yes, yes, yes. Although you started the experiment the same way. Yes, the same way. Ah, okay. Yeah, and with the same threshold. That yeah. makes sense now. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have an explanation why the SQ plus APQ1 is, performs better than the full precision model? Or is it just by chance? Because you trained a lot of models and then one got eventually better. Uh, I assume that it uh, gets uh, a a matched quantization scheme, so it can get better pre pre process. So it's not a random re result. I trained many times, and I got the same re result, so I put it there. Okay. 